Oh, that's never good. That is never, never good. Okay. We'll do it. All right, you rolling? <clears throat> okay, um, of course we're in <clears throat> Philippians, uh, but we're going to pick up where we left off last class in First uh, Timothy chapter 2. Now, <clears throat> what we went over the last two um, sessions was uh, we were discussing what is man. We went to uh, Psalm 8. And there we found that David himself was questioning, you know, what is, what is the deal with man? Why is man so important to the plan of God? And that took us over to Genesis, the very beginning, even before the fall, excuse me, where God gave man dominion uh, over the things of the earth. And... Um, uh, then we saw that was over in the first chapter and then in the third chapter we saw the fall of man and we discussed how this um, this fall didn't like hand uh, the devil his personal man's personal authority and dominion Basically, he handed him his nature, and if that and if that if that was true of Adam and Eve, the first couple, and everyone who was going to be born after them would be, as it says in, in I think it's around Genesis eight, uh, that Adam uh, Adam was made in the image of God, but then it says he fell, and then everyone was made in Adam and Eve's uh, image. And that's where we get the term Adam, representing not the original man, but the original man's fall and therefore affecting the whole race. <clears throat> and so, um, by this uh, means he handed over, really not the dominion, but his nature over which uh, the enemy had dominion over Adam and all that have fallen in him and therefore with him. <clears throat> so it would be a little bit like um, um, a sheriff, you know, uh, and he has authority and he has power. Um, and then somebody comes in town and they're a mobster. But instead of handing the mobster his badge and his gun, he... he his nature is such that he is controlled by the mobster with the result that the sheriff uses his gun, uses his authority, uses his badge for, for the benefit of the mobster just because, the way we would say it, is because he had him in his pocket. And so <clears throat> this is basically how the dominion of man uh, was lost to the enemy because he had no strength. He had no ability to overcome. He had no, after he fell into sin, the enemy could easily trick him or could easily manipulate him or could intimidate him to do whatever he wanted to do. <clears throat> and he still does that kind of stuff to this day. So um, we looked at that and then we, <clears throat> we went to Isaiah and we saw there where it says, <clears throat> there was all of this stuff wrong with mankind and all of this stuff wrong in the world and God looked and marveled that there was no man, no intercessor, but then he said no man. Um, and uh, that's because all men were now under the dominion of the enemy. And um, <clears throat> so then finally we ended up in our last class right here in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. And it says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. <clears throat> and so, um, the goal, <clears throat> the goal was to bring man back under God. And as such, that would bring his authority back under his dominion would be uh, uh, served under the authority and under the leadership of God. And so that's why it 
says right here, for there's one God, and one mediator between God and men, the man. The only one who could make that bridge, that could truly make that bridge, was a man. And so that's why it's emphasizing this part here. And then, of course, uh, I always like this. Who gave him, the next verse says, it's a comma after the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Um, because I believe, personally, <clears throat> that being an intercessor, being a mediator, being a go-between, as understood by the Lord, <clears throat> is not as we suppose to be. It is not primarily, I'm saying this because this is what we believe it primarily to be. To be, to, to be an intercessor <clears throat> between God and man is not primarily pray. <coughs> it's not primarily pray, although that's the understood thing. But um, in reality, it is that which stands between and makes the bridge. And prayer alone doesn't do that. Uh, the proof of that is when it says right here that he's a mediator. Who gave himself? The man, Jesus, the man Christ Jesus. Who gave himself? You say, well, how does that explain it? Well, he gave himself a ransom for all. Um, very well put. A ransom for all. And so Jesus was that man. And uh, those were the things that we were looking at last class. And um, we were just about to get to Ephesians. So if you'll turn to Ephesians with me. Ephesians chapter 4. Now, remember that, uh, and I'll draw it here. It's been a long time since I remember. That even that's a stretch here. <coughs> no, no, that's good. They try to keep me on a leash. Sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> so we had uh, the first man, Adam, and we're going to describe him as, you know, the first man. The Bible, when the Bible talks about the first man. Adam, it is not talking about the individual man, but I want to I want to explain that the first man, literal first man, was Adam. But uh, and you remember that he originally was created in the image of God, and that image gave God access. Now, that's a big deal because God didn't have to give man to me. God is God, and he rules everything. You know, we said he rules the world. No, I mean, he rules everything, whatever, whatever we don't know about, you know. Um, and he has complete rule, but he decided <clears throat> that he was going to give man dominion. And in so doing, he was going to do that in relationship, and I, I want to start showing you this. He was going to do that in relationship to man being working under him, man functioning not as an individual with dominion that does what he wants, but functioning in relation or in relationship with God so that... Man was never meant to just be like the other creatures where he just made it, turned it loose and said, OK, 
Okay, sera, sera. Whatever happens, you, you know, find your way. Do the best you can, you know, you know, <clears throat> however things go. There was meant to be this relationship and this relating and not just, you know, uh, long distance because we see in um, Genesis, in the first few chapters there, that God came down and walked with man in the cool of the day and that there was this relating and God was the one who came down and God was the one who wanted a relationship and God was the one and, and he wanted more than a religious relationship. He didn't give man authority and dominion over steeples or pews. Amen. You understand my point? My point Amen. being, it wasn't a religious thing. It was a functioning, how you function and how you relate and how there was, there was a, you know, in a sense you could say that it was similar to a bride in the sense that um, not, you know, this may be controversial to some people, but, uh, you know, that, uh, that a bride doesn't just get married and then go do her own thing and go her own way and have just no access or interest in accessing the husband. Um, and what we see usually from that is that you know, people don't get along very well when that happens, when your interests are so different and so far and completely that. Um, the Lord wanted a union-type relationship where there would be this uh, dependency. Isn't it interesting? Because he made man um, uh, an, an, an independent being but he wanted man to have a dependency upon God. Well, you say, okay, you know, we're not supposed to really make big decisions or stuff like that without checking with the Lord. So the, the serpent shows up and says, hey, why don't you eat one of these things? You don't have to listen to God. No big deal. Boom. Trouble. No. No. Not trouble. The ruin of all creation and all mankind. Well, don't make such a big deal out of this being under God's authority with him giving you authority. Well, no, no. The first mistake, the big mistake was it wiped out everybody. And so, so all that came out, and so here you have the family tree and all that came out of Adam and Eve, uh, all of them had this same fallen nature. And it just kept multiplying and growing and growing and growing. <clears throat> but the difference is, now we can mark this out, darken it, and all of these, it's funny to darken it, but it's dark behind it, and this is light. But anyway, get my uh, All of them coming out with this same nature, <clears throat> and um, in so doing, became Adam, all that are born, are born in Adam. All that are born, are born with a fallen nature. All are Adam in the sense of fallen Adam is the, is the representation there. So, so the whole thing is named Adam. And so, when the Lord came, you know, his plan wasn't just to be what God wanted. And we'll get into that probably next class a little more. I'll try to explain that a little more. But his plan was to do basically the same thing except in reverse. And that's where you, you read in uh, Romans 5 where it says, as in Adam all died, so in Christ all. And Christ being the new man, um, Adam being the the first man, Adam, Jesus being 
not the second man, and the second Adam. He was the second man in that that second represents mankind. This was one kind of mankind, and this is, this is an important point. All that came from Adam, or all that was born into this earth by natural birth need to be born again. Amen. Okay. Now, the actual Greek of that word is not born again, but born from above. Born from above, meaning, I mean, there's, there, you can say born again, but in a sense, with your mind, you could say, well, I'm born again, again. So it's me again, only better. Okay, well, that's not the case. Um, but when you're born from above, you are born from him who is from above, which is Christ. And then, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this new man, this, this uh, uh, last Adam, and I don't want to get into all of these different parts, but uh, he's called the last Adam because when he went to the cross, he went as Adam. He carried this whole creation. He didn't just, Jesus didn't have to die. He had nothing that he needed to die for. But he joined himself to us and he took all of this first man to the cross. And this at the cross is where he's the last Adam because he's the last of Adam in the eternal plan of God, in the, in the mind of God and in the eternal plan of God, Adam is dead. Okay. And that's, that's subtle with God. The problem is, if it's not subtle with us, then we're going to have, we're going to have difficulties because we're going to hear it. We're going to think that, you know, we're, that we are embracing it because we embrace the truth of it. Let me just make it absolutely clear. To embrace these realities is to say, this is my truth. This is not just my truth, my identity. Because the true knowledge that changes you is the knowledge of identity that moves you from one reality to another. This, in God's mind, is the old creation. Over here, after the cross, is the new creation. And uh, I like one of the translators, they say, if any man be in Christ, he is a new species. Okay. What does that mean? Have you ever, you know, I mean, sometimes uh, people be, you know, going, studying things down in the deep or down in the rainforests of, of Colombia, uh, Amazon, and they'll find a whole nother species of something that never saw before. Okay. If, that, that is representing something altogether new when it says a new creation. And that's why the word new is used. It is not the old improved. And when it says new, and this is, this is just so important. Behold, all things are become new and all things are of God. Where, where does that come from? 2 Corinthians 5.17. If any man be in union with Christ, meaning you're in here, and the reason why I don't draw those circles anymore is because it's not you in there as you, because you draw that circle, you'll see this circle over here in Adam, and you'll place it over here, and you're, you'll just say, well, it's still me. But if you do it properly, this new man is singular. And all of us are members of his body. It is one man and one new man. And we are known as members of his body. Brother, we'll pray for you when we get through. I heard that you had a little head fall. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So, uh, and by the way, when, when bad things like that happen, you can miss class and we give you permission to. You know, honestly, I kind of fell asleep a little. That's why I'm okay. a late. You know, I'm, just, I'm just letting you know okay. there's no pressure under those kind of circumstances. <clears throat> All right. So, um, 
so we're getting now to the point that Ephesians is talking about, and that is that this new man, this new man, not new men, and you know what? It never calls us new men. It is new man, and yes, it is, it is a new mankind, but it is no longer just Jesus who came as an individual, and he was different, and as I said, we'll get into that more in the next class. He was different from everybody else. But it is this risen body that he's made us. He made us the body of Christ. And that has to be more than theology and doctrine. and um, Something has to come into us that says, I am no longer who I was because of the cross. Wait. I am no longer because of the cross. Amen. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by the faith that I am crucified with Christ. Oh, nevertheless, I live, but not I. Christ is the one who's living in me. Nevertheless, I live, and you look at me, and you see my same old body, which didn't change from Adam to Christ. But the thing that was important did change. I am crucified. Christ lives within me. When he says, not I, no, when he says, nevertheless, I live, we, we look at the body or we look at the personality. When we get to the core, folks, it can't be Christian. Amen. It's got to be Christ. God didn't raise Christianity up. He didn't. He raised up Christ from the dead. Amen. Okay. And when we say he raised Christ up from the dead, it means from the putting to death of everything that was you, everything that was your way, everything that was your understanding, based on that fallen nature, and he took you to the cross, and he took me there, and he took the whole race and he put it to death. And in his mind, it'll never, and, and again, before we get into this scripture, you have to see this. In God's mind, this is settled. Okay. And I'll just say this. This basically, this teaching, this reality, this is the mind of God. This is the mind of God. This isn't the mind of Randy. I got this from the Word. Paul got it from the Word. Everyone got it from the Word. If you follow this out, you come to one conclusion. The cross was the dividing point between what was and what is. And in God's mind, just being a Christian, just going to a church, just praying and doing all of that, folks, Israel did all of that stuff. They went to temple, they prayed, they read their Bibles, they tithed, they did all of those things. And Paul left it. He left it. And he said, this is not it. This is not it anymore. He said, all those things, and this is, this is actually over in Philippians just shortly after the scripture we're talking about. He says, the things that were gained to me, I count loss. And, and shortly after that, he says, I count it all as dumb or poop or, you know, there's several other words that you could use, um, you know. Uh, I remember I was teaching at the conference once and I said, I read that where it says, I count all things but dumb, you know that I may win Christ. And I said, here's the way to know what that scripture is saying. Jesus is number one and we're number two. <laughs> <laughs> and if you actually, actually, actually looked at it like that, if you did, if you did, honestly, if you did, what you would do is you would quit trying to offer God a bunch of crap. Yeah. That's, I mean, I'm just being, I am serious. We would quit trying to offer God crap. We would quit trying to be something. Instead, we would focus on the cross 
and we would quit trying to, to improve ourselves, we would realize the cross and seek Christ. Our, our mind, we would want our minds washed from the old, and the only way you can get it washed is by seeing through revelation, by the Holy Spirit, opening the eyes of your understanding of what the cross really did and what it really means and what survived it. And, and if we don't see that, if Christianity doesn't see that, if they skip Ephesians 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, and 5, and they only go to 6, and you skip Colossians 1 and 2 and, I'm sorry, 3, except for the last few verses, and you skip a, a huge majority of Galatians, and you just, you, you find a few scriptures, and here's what we do. We find those scriptures in the Gospels. Folks, let me just say it perfectly clear. The Gospels are not the beginning of the New Testament. I know somebody divided your Bible like that, and they said that, that Malachi was the end of the Old Testament, and the New Testament begins at Matthew. No, sir. The New Testament does not begin until the resurrection of Christ. The church did not begin until the resurrection of Christ. That's absolutely the truth. There's no doubt about it. Jesus was walking as a, a man and as a uh, under the old covenant. Um, even through all of that, Jesus was walking as a single individual who was different than all other individuals, and that saved nobody. Just being different, just being other, didn't change it. Jesus healed, and then he realized, and he says, he says stuff like that over in uh, John chapter 12. He says, and though he did so many miracles among them, yet they believed not in him. Um, because all the miracle working on behalf of people does not change their insides. Right. You can heal somebody's body. Folks, you can cast a demon out of somebody. And they might be sweeter, but they're still at them. Right. You know, unless you're born from above. And that means not I, but Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay? That means the new man. Only the new man. And so... Anything that they're teaching and everything is pre-cross. It is. You say, well, it's just barely pre-cross. Well, you know, that's like that's like that's the picture I got years ago. Was this old house from this couple that had lived for years and years and years, and and her husband, her old man, is dying, and he's in the very back room in a screened-in porch, and he's been laying on the bed. And he's laying there, and I mean, he's, he's, he's about there. And he goes, okay, I can't do anything. I can't get up. I can't, you know, I can't yell at you like I used to. I can't do this. I can't do that, whatever. But the issue is you're still alive. You're not dead. Until you die, it doesn't matter what you do, what you change. You know, that's like, that's like, being a child and playing with childish things, you know, it says that in First Corinthians, and and we say, okay, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Oh, don't don't misunderstand what that says. It says when I became a man, I put away childish things. You can put away childish things. A child can stop playing with toys and pick up a Bible and read it, and it doesn't transform them into being an adult. The goal is not to change the things. The goal is to become mature. The goal is to become this man, or one with this man, which is Christ, his body, his bride, his, the, I think the body picture is the best picture right now in relationship to seeing that there's not many. If you see, if you look at certain things from the bride aspect, then you will see yourself as an individual you must keep your mind and your eyes on both bride and body because is not the is not the bride also called his body? It is the it is the same thing, but it's trying to show you different relationships. 
And part of that relationship is, when it comes to the bride, it is her heart towards him. It is not the fact that she is outside of him going after him and going, I love you and I'm with you. And that's not a good picture. The only true good picture of the bride, the, the clearest, is her heart for him and him alone above herself, above her name, above her ambitions, above her plans. But the body reflects this reality. There are not two in this relationship. There is, there is one. Okay. Now, having said that, I don't want to go too far here, but having said that, uh, people talk about having a per personal relationship with Jesus personal relationship with Jesus. Is that anybody ever heard that, that phrase before? Having a personal relationship with Jesus. Anybody ever read that in the Bible? Is that? No. Because personal takes it right outside of the resurrection reality in the sense of it makes it individual. Now, let me clarify that. So, I mean, uh, yes, you come to Jesus individually. But when you do, the reality is, is that the Holy Spirit shows you that you, the individual who came to Jesus, died and now you're one in him with many other members of his body. Is that right or wrong? Right. Okay, so, so this personal relationship with Christ is almost completely touting the fact of me and Jesus and that we've got a good relationship. The relationship you are to have with Jesus is uh, as a vehicle of Christ. You say, where do you get that from? Okay. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power would be God and not us. There's a vehicle and he's the treasure with the power or with the Ability. We are the body of Christ. We're the vehicle. He's the life. Um, I'm trying to think of all the different ones. Uh, branch and vine. We're the vehicle of the vine life that comes into us and brings forth fruit. On and on and on, folks. All of those are relationships where we have. We are meant to. From the very beginning, God had in mind a relationship with man, and that's the relationship he wanted. How is it, how is it described more simply than that? Jesus used this phrase all the time. I and you and you and me. He uses it all the time. I and you and you and me. Well, we go, okay, well, you're in me. And I'm in you because theologically I've been taught that. Okay. None of this should be theological. Every ounce of this needs to be the actual result of the Holy Spirit opening our eyes <coughs> to see this. And the only right way to approach this and all of this teaching is not to listen carefully and try to get it. The only right way is, is to, um, I, you know, I just, I hate to use this example, but I'm going to. I, I see Nicole writing a lot and different ones. When I was first wanting to get this in me, and I still do to this day. I still, I have more notebooks than I know what to do with. I could never publish everything I've ever written down. But I would write down what the Holy Spirit <clears throat> was saying to me. Because, you know, the speaker can say a lot. And only about 2% of it, the Holy Spirit, the dove comes on it. Do you understand what I'm saying? You yes. know, a lot of it can go, do, 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 do. it's like a parade walking by. Me. It's pretty, but I don't get it. But then one clown jumps out to you and goes, yeah, I get that. Or you, you understand what I'm saying. 
And uh, my examples are always weird. But, <laughs> but at least you see a lot passing in front of you and you're not really getting the whole thing. And then, and then taking that back and in my time, my time, getting into the Word. And I'll tell you, this is the absolute truth. When I came out of Bible school, I came out with the beginnings of the revelation of Christ. God had begun to reveal his son in me. And that happened not because of class or homework. That happened because when I got out of class, I took those notes and I went over the word and I asked the Holy Spirit open, because he, remember, he was the one who sort of fell on those particular areas. Open my eyes, open my heart. Let me see this as you see it, not as the teacher sees it, you know, not as Brother Lumen sees it or Brother Litzman or somebody else. I need to see Jesus. I must see Jesus. I must not be about my father's business until I see Jesus. I am desperate for you, Lord. The, the problem is we go years without seeing anything because we haven't pressed in like we should, and then after a while it gets old hat just to listen. But, you, but I am desperate for you, Lord, because, because after a while, it's like, even though it's of God, even if it's anointed and powerful and knocked you over, it's, it's, it dulls you. It just dulls you. You just get dull to it because you, you've never pressed in enough to let it, you know, it's like these swine flu shots. You know what a swine flu shot or any shot is. It's a little bit of disease. That's what it is. It's a little bit of the disease and then your body works up all of this stuff um, to fight against it, and then now you can't get it. Well, that's the problem. Most people get just a little bit of this, just enough to inoculate themselves against it, and then all these things flurry and stand up against it, and then make it where it doesn't, it never really gets in because we wait too long, and we lose that um, desire. What is the the thing of the conference this year? Always hungry, never satisfied. Always hungry and never satisfied. And I, um, and in fact, today, today, I found some old notes that went back to uh, the early part of when we were on Maple Street. You know, some of y'all remember that? Well, a lot of you remember that. And I started reading them and I just went, oh, oh, the arrows of the Almighty struck me. The, the arrows of the Lord were released and found their mark. Oh. And all it was was about Jesus. All it was was the truth of him. All it was, but I just went, oh, God, you, you, you showed me this. You whispered this to me. And I wrote it down and I never went back again. And I'm back now. That's what I tell you. I'm back now. <laughs> it's been quite a few years, but I need to see this. Um, I realized that I've got enough stuff that the Holy Spirit came, you know, over 40 years, you've heard a lot of preachers. And you've heard a lot of things from the Lord. And I realized that I have enough stuff that the Holy Spirit himself, the dove, came down on, even if it was ever so small in 40 years. I've got enough of that. I don't need to be scrounging around reading 100 books trying to find it. Mm -hmm. Amen. Now, I'm not discouraging anybody from reading books and stuff like that because you know, I, I do a little rotating thing where I'll read someone's book and then I'll just read the word for a while and then I'll listen to the tape and then I'll, you know, I'll, I, I keep myself moving so I don't get bored, you know what I mean? And I always keep it changed and when it starts bogging down in this, I'll move into another realm. But, but I'm in a place, and you, you're probably not, but I'm in a place where I need to just go back and let, you know, so-and-so uh, plant it and maybe even someone came along and spoke on that later and watered. 
but doggone it, it's worthless unless God starts bringing an increase in you. Amen. You know what I'm saying? Yep. And I have, I mean, I have been, uh, there's been so much stuff planted in me. And there have been so many good brothers and sisters, whether sharing in church or, or Bible school or wherever I am, that have watered things that the Lord planted in me. But now I'm, I need to keep looking to the Lord for the increase of it. And so, um, Ephesians 4, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth not walk as other Gentiles walk. Okay, just stop right there. This is Paul talking to real people. This is not the Bible. You understand the difference I'm making here? We say, well, this is the Bible, so it, it, it doesn't have any real life rubber meets the road thing to us. It's just the Bible. Okay. But this isn't the Bible. This is a brother who saw Jesus. This is a brother who spent his life seeing Jesus. This is a brother who spent his life writing it down. This is a brother who, who went everywhere and shared Christ as much as he could. And he says to these Ephesians, and by the way, the Ephesians are among the most spiritual of all the letters that he wrote to. Not the Galatians, not the Corinthians, but the Ephesians are, and he's saying to the Ephesians, look, this is what I'm saying to you. And I'm testifying in the Lord. Don't walk like they walk. Don't walk based on the same motivations. Don't walk, you know, because we, we, again, we change what we do but the motivation is the same. You know, when I was in the world, I did certain things, but I did it for me, and I did it for the benefit of what it would bring me. Do you understand what I'm saying when I say that? But then you come into Christianity, and then you get involved with things that benefit you and that make you feel good, and da 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 da, and on and on and on. It's, it's just a replay of Adam over and over, and Paul's looking at the church. And he's saying, you know, I see trends. <laughs> I see things happening <clears throat> in how we relate. <laughs> and, and he's saying, look, I'm telling you in the Lord, our walk needs to be different. Okay. Well, what do we get from that? We shouldn't be like the world. We should be like Christians. God forbid. <laughs> I think most Christians, I think a lot of Christians that I've run into are worse than the world. I have friends that are not born again in the world. I was looking at a picture. I've got on my desk right in there. He was my best friend in high school, and he's still a real good friend. What do you think of that? He's not born again. We hang out. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Because he's not sitting judging everything that I say or do, you know. Whereas most Christians, man, they're just looking for something. They, you know, if you mess up, if you sin, if you do one thing wrong, man, they're ready to take your, you know. Now, of course, if they do it, they want you to be merciful. Right? If, if they yes. sin or they mess up, they want you to be merciful, don't they? Yes. However, when you mess up, they don't remember the times you were merciful. <laughs> But here's the deal. They're not supposed to. It's not about tit for tat. Is it Christ? Is it Christ? Is it Christ? And if it's if it's us just releasing people and you know, whatever, and it's not Christ, that's not good either. In other words, our goal is not. Christian principles are, which by the way, there are no such thing. There's only the new man. Again, Christianity is not the religion inside of this man. The nature of Christ is not the religion, but is the, the dynamo, the power that produces all that Jesus produced. And you, don't, you don't think Jesus walked around with a set of Ten Commandments written down and when he got ready to go into ministry, the devil tempted him, going, okay, uh, 
And remember, he quoted that. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. When the devil said, cast, excuse me, cast yourself down from here. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. He quoted one of the Ten Commandments. He's living by the Ten Commandments. No, we discussed that in the past. He, he doesn't have, uh, uh, you know, stone tablets that guide him. He is forgiven. He is uh, uh, certain things, and he is not certain other things. And so our goal is not to figure out the rules of Christianity and then walk by them, because if you do, you're still walking by an old nature, an old man. This I say, therefore, in testifying the Lord, that henceforth, you walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their minds. And that's, okay, what does that mean? Mine says futility. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else have another translation? Um. In the vanity of their mind. Okay. Or the futility of their mind. Okay. So let's, let's figure out, let's figure out what everybody thinks real quick and not do it. Let's think of all the futile things and not go, that's not the answer. <laughs> There's one mind that is not futile. Futile. There's one mind that is not just nothing but vanity. It is the mind of Christ. It is the scriptures that, that started this whole course of kenosis. It is let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who thought it not right. Folks, that's the only mind that is not just out and out in vain. And God was gracious to us not to say, have the mind of Christ and not tell us how it operates, meaning this. He didn't give us like a definition. He did. And that definition of the mind, he says, let this mind be in you. And then he describes it and he says it is self-giving. He describes it and he says it humbles itself. He describes it and he says it's not grasping after uh, high things. He describes it and it is the exact opposite of these people. You know, for example, Paul says to, I forget which of the churches, he says, mind not high things but condescend to men of low estate. Well, that's, that's not Christianity right there. Everybody's climbing up, trying to be higher, and trying to be bigger, and trying to be more spiritual, and have more gifts, and operate more, and be respected by everybody and everything. Jesus did the exact opposite of that. Amen. You know? And Christ in us, if it's, it's his life, trust me, if God wants to raise somebody up, we think, well, if I don't, if I don't take advantage of every door that's open, if I don't make every contact, if I don't do, you know, um, you know, nurture these contacts, I'll never be any, I'll never get anywhere for God. Well, that's, that's dumb. You know, I remember a guy that, you know, I don't know what wearing camel hair is like. But I think that would be smelly. I don't know about eating locust. I mean, I, I would imagine they're crunchy. <laughs> the honey thing. helps. The honey <laughs> helps. I know my wife likes crunchy. But she doesn't necessarily like sweet. It would have to be like sweet and sour sauce on her locust. <laughs> but... You know, this, and not only that, this guy's not in the center of town yelling. He's way out on the Jordan, folks. Jerusalem is not like, you know, steps away from the Jordan. Okay. It's far away. It's past Jericho. He's out there baptizing people, and everybody starts coming to him. Why? Because he's lifting up Jesus. Why? You know, now, you go down here on the square, or you go out here you know, the Trinity River down here somewhere, try that, and just start saying, Jesus, Jesus. It's not, the, it's not saying J-E-S-U-S. -S. It is 
knowing the Lord and really knowing the Lord. You know, Abraham really met the Lord. That's why he's in the Bible. Amen. He actually, and, and when I say really, I mean it changed his whole life and the influence of everybody around. David, on and on and on, the people of the Bible had something, okay? And I said, God is able. He may not. Because God's program is not to make you something. And it's so funny because it's like John the Baptist must have figured that out. So he's out there wearing camel hair and, you know, uh, preaching and eating locusts and doing all that kind of stuff. Did you know that he's the son of a priest? Zachariah was his father. He's the son of a priest. Right. He, could, he could have climbed the ladder. His dad had worked all the way up to the altar of incense, folks. Next stop, Holy of Holies. Right? I mean, if you progress through the tabernacle, you get to the altar of incense right behind that curtain. Holy of Holies. He didn't go that route. And so you say, okay, so I can see him in his mind going, Oh, Lord, just bless my ministry and make me popular and famous. And do you think that was what was going on? No, no, he's just trying to obey what the Lord says. So, so all of a sudden, everybody starts coming, and all these, there's these big crowds, and then people start <laughs> asking the big question, who are you? Who are you? Oh, this is it. Well, I'm just a poor boy who knows Jesus. <laughs> no, he said, I'm, I am nothing. I am not worth, you know, I am not the one. And the one that is the one, I am not worthy to unloose his shoe latch. I am the voice <coughs> that is declaring someone else other than myself. Folks, that's, that's getting low again. That's taking the lower seat. That's, but, but now remember this, that is not taking the lower seat. Jesus taught that, that is letting this mind be in him, which was also in Christ Jesus. He probably never heard the lower seat teaching. And yes. All right. So I haven't even finished my scriptures here, but it's almost time to quit. And my left foot for the last 15 minutes has gone into a charlie horse. Randy, do you want me to get the chair for you? I walk over there and sit down just like I normally would. Okay. It hurts, but the Lord is able to take care of headaches and foot aches and stuff like that. Amen. 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 All right, let's be dismissed and we'll come back. Thank you. Any others to say that? Yeah. Thanks. I know.